look into the future. Welcome to Machines and More. From the looks of it, that future, it's pretty heavy and beefy too. So if you caught a glance of the marketing material from the Shift XT preview, it almost looks like there's three space pod themed cases that are being released and all three of these look intriguing in their own way. And you're probably like, gosh, I buy the small, the medium or the large one, right? And the good news is you can have one of each because they're each in one. Today, Fantex's uh, new Evolve Shift XT is being released. It's a really well thought out case from the company based in the Netherlands with some very innovative features that we'll take a look at today. The goal of this review is just for you to get a feel of the case and its features, the different configurations, which we'll spend a lot of time talking about. And uh, uh, of course, the performance differences between those modes and ultimately whether or not this might be the right case for you. And you know what, if you're into SFF, I think you're gonna wanna take a good look at this one. And uh, please hit that subscribe button now if you haven't done so already. It really does make a difference. And hey, if you're watching this review, chances are you will enjoy the rest of the SFF content here on this channel. So I'd love to have you along. And uh, before we begin the review here, I'd like to thank Fantex for providing the review unit as well as a few of the accessories we're checking out today. This video is not sponsored by them and they have no prior knowledge of any of the review content or the findings. So as always, you can expect a fair and honest review. I'll lead with the headline feature here. This sandwich stall case, it's 13 and a half liters. It's also 15.7 liters and yeah, it's also 17.5 liters you choose. The footprint is all the same, 371 millimeters long by 173 millimeters wide, and the only thing that changes is the height. In the most compact configuration, the case stands 211 millimeters tall, and this is suited for air-cooled CPU builds with no top fans, up to 72 millimeters of cooler clearance. In the medium, air boost configuration is 244 millimeters tall, and this will allow the use of up to 32 millimeter thick case fans with that same air cooler spec. And I know, funny you should choose that number, Fantex. <laughs> and in the largest liquid cooled configuration, like I've set it up the last one I tested, it'll be 272 millimeters tall, and that will fit a 240 AIO up to 60 millimeters of clearance for your rad and your fans at the top. From the outside, this case retains a lot of the design cues from the other members of the Evolve Shift family, but the way it comes together is actually really, really unique. In the middle, you have the steel chassis, and on the outside, you have two half shells machined out of this really thick two and a half or three millimeters thick aluminum, it seems like, and it's uh, these two shells, the top one specifically, that lets you vary the height of the case. Fantex accomplishes this with a three position standoff system on the top shell and each setting puts the top half at a different resting height. At the back of the case, you would either use no plastic insert or a smaller medium one for your medium and large configurations and that props up the, the rear of the case to the appropriate height and also closes up the gap that would otherwise be unsightly there. This case is futuristic looking and with the way the vents are cut, and the chamfered angles on the exterior. This one is right out of Halo. But what I didn't expect is that it works with a spaceship-like precision and ingenuity too, with a system of latches, uh, sliding locks, magnets, and these mechanical interfaces. Uh, they're such a pleasure to tinker with. You know, there's it's just so, there's so much stuff going on here. To remove the top shell, you just pop off that magnetic front panel and you slide these latches inward and then uh, the top will slide off. And the mesh panels, they slide off too. For the bottom shell to come off, you remove the screw at the back and then you can push the chassis to the front and that disengages the pin lock at the back and frees the bottom shell. The varying height doesn't leave a gap on the front either. This tempered glass front panel has enough length to it that the top shell can travel along it, exposing more of the insert the taller you go. 
And this isn't just a tempered glass panel, right? It's the future. <laughs> the radiator and uh, fan bracket even swing up to allow for easy access. And that just swings out of the way if you're doing some maintenance. It all starts from the opening moment. When you unbox the case, it's one of the best packed cases. It comes in a very snug foam insert and with the accessories box in its own cutout, the whole unit is presented in a very nice bag. And you can also reuse this if you're transporting it and you wanna give it some extra protection. You get a bag of hardware, a two and a half inch SSD bracket, which in that same theme, it also slides in and out and a compact screwdriver that you can use to adjust those standoffs and a locking device for your riser cable and also some dust filters which can be mounted to the top panel. This case is a sandwich style layout which means your graphics card is connected to your mini ITX motherboard by means of a Gen 4 riser cable and the motherboard is inverted with the GPU vertical but what most of us would commonly consider right side up for a vertical GPU. And the maximum size here is 324 millimeters long, 147 millimeters tall, and three slots are about 62 millimeters in thickness. And that covers a lot of the bigger cards available on the market now. Where's that friend I.O.? Well, one 3.0 USB-A and a 3.1 Gen 2 USB-C port is uh, it's hidden behind the sliding panel on the front and that can slide up and out too. But along with that panel is my favorite feature of this case, the power button. There's something strangely satisfying about the travel and click of this power button, much like one of my other favorite computing sounds. The front panel's DRGB is powered off of your power supply, but that is independent of your motherboard and you can further control other DRGB goodies with the downstream cable. I won't spend as much time going into some of the finer details of the build process since I will do a detailed guide on this one and uh, I did want to devote a little more time to talk about each of the three configurations and for the build today I'm going to be using the same kit that we did for the Lian Li A4H20 review, the SUS B550ITX, 3700X, 3080XC3 with the uh, Team Group RAM kit and the Cardia SSD. And today we'll also check out the new Fantex Revolt SFX power supply that's launching today. This one here is the 80 plus platinum unit. It's actually really nice. To build, you'll remove the panels and focus on the center chassis. I'll show you the air-cooled build process here with this IS60 Evo with the fan upgrade. And uh, you'll just hook up all the PSU cables first. Mount up the board into the case and then connect up the front IO cables. And then you just have the USB headers and the power button. It's pretty clean and pre-routed. Insert the riser cable and just make sure that uh, this one is seated tight because it's pretty stiff and it seems to want to pull away from the board. Use the riser cable latch to lock it in place. Then you can pop your power supply cables back into the power supply. The cables exit out the top. In this case, with this heatsink, can fit that full 25 millimeter fan. We'll be running the Noctua NFA 12 by 25 to give us the most headroom for air cooling testing. You can just run your GPU power cables and the SATA power cable now if you want the case's RGB. At this point, you can focus your attention to the GPU side of the house. Just pop the GPU into the riser cable, plug the power in, and you can actually insert your cables pretty easily that uh, with the top cover off and there's even an optional velcro tie to hold the cables and that is it if you want the air boost config just pop the standoffs in into position two put the small rear block in and you can screw two fans into the top of the case if you're doing the 240 position three large block and really it's just a matter of running your tubes through the cage and attaching the block back to your motherboard and here i'm testing with the fantax glacier one and hey there's space for the t30s too so why not right okay overall this case is very beginner friendly and it's not just the way the case opens up with easy access for everything i mean this documentation it's great with very detailed illustrations and i think any person who is new to this will really appreciate this manual 
power supply in this position actually makes a lot of sense. And you'll notice a lot of sandwich style cases, the power supply goes the other direction, which, okay, if you wanna be seeing the insides and you wanna hide the cables, that maybe makes sense. But here it's all completely contained. You're not gonna see into this thing. And that makes it just so much more accessible, easy to build, even airflow wise. It makes more sense since you just have the power supply that's taking care of its own cooling without potentially dumping more heat into an exhausting rad if you have one. The Fantex Revolt SFX power supply, it's pretty good and I've been testing it out for quite some time now. The OEM is Seasonic and Fantex is upfront about that, which is great because Seasonic is actually one of the best power supply manufacturers out there. The fan, it's its a little, you can hear it a little bit when it first starts uh, spinning up, but it's, it's a really, really quiet fan and I, I really like this unit. The riser cable, it's a double layer one. It's really, really thick compared to most cables. You'll see that come with sandwich style cases, but it is very rigid. And you will wanna make sure it's uh, securely inserted into the expansion slot since I definitely got the impression it was pushing out a little bit and you'll make sure you use that locking mechanism. One thing, the location of that power connector at the bottom does prevent you from simply just shifting out that riser cable to push the two slot cards out to the outermost position. You can actually do that pretty easily in the A4H20 that we just checked out. So this case is gonna be a little more limiting for Founders Edition and pair cards and it really would have been nice to have that option there. Overall, this was a fun case to test since it can be configured in three ways. And let's just spend some time to talk about the thermal performance between the three modes. And as you might imagine, the three cases have varying degrees of performance levels. For the air cool test, I did run the cooler fan at 100% since we are simulating a higher load here. Of course, for gaming, you don't, probably don't need to run it that hard, but actually it is a very quiet fan here with the cooler that I set it up with and the T30s as the case fans, they are running at about 1200 RPM and those are also very quiet at that level. When they were used as rad fans, I set them as 1525 RPM to match the noise levels for the other cases that we're comparing against today. And some of them were actually tested with those same fans at that level as well. And later on, I'll give you a quick noise comparison between the three modes. All right, so to start off, let's compare CPU only thermals. I test it with a overclock 3700X at about 95 watts of total package power. And as good as this heatsink is, it still needs the help of good case fans. So in the compact configuration, did not pass that test. I did have to downclock and at 1.2 volts, it had 77.4 degrees. Uh, not comparable to the higher voltage uh, scenarios, but yes, obviously in a CPU only scenario, your 240, it's gonna be a lot better. Although I gotta say, it's not too bad for a single fan on a tiny little heatsink like this. And it is taking advantage of a more direct airflow path compared to the one that the rad fans would have to take through the side panel and then uh, in and, and out through the top. I've only tested the similar setup here with the Q58 from Lee and Lee but uh, it's pretty comparable. The Shift XT does run a little bit behind here and that is considering that the Q58 was in fact using a weaker slim fan. The Shift XT has a pretty generous amount of clearance for an air cooler. And in the 72 millimeter height, you could go with low profile coolers using slim fans such as the Noctua All 12 S, the Scythe Big Shuriken 3. You can kind of piece together your own combo with a 25 millimeter fan like I've done here. All right, next up, gaming. I'd imagine this is the most common use case with uh, Red Dead 2 in 1440p. You'll see here it's averaging just over 100 FPS, and now we're beginning to see some of the limitations of the most compact configuration when using a high-powered GPU like the 3080 here. And at this point, the GPU was holding back pretty significantly at about 1400 megahertz. So definitely, if you're gonna be running something that's that high powered, I tend to recommend either the medium or the large configurations. And perhaps it might be surprising, but in a combined usage scenario, especially with a higher powered GPU, since we're talking about 325 watts here, the air cooler with top fans, it's actually gonna beat out the EIO simply because the exhausting rat is the single point of exit for the AIB cards exhaust. While the air cooler, it's running pretty unimpeded. It's taking all the cooler air from the outside. So while there's not a meaningful change here for the GPU between the two different configurations, uh, if gaming is all you're doing, then actually that air boost configuration, or the medium configuration, it's gonna be pretty compelling. Still, these GPU temps are a bit on the high side. And when we compare it to the Q58 again, it does appear to be a step behind still. 
In the medium configuration, I did try a few things to drill down for the heavier GPU temps and even taking the air filters off to see if they were too restrictive, uh, that wasn't the answer. And even though the GPU has a more open air intake path in that scenario, the case fans, they don't help it out anymore because they're just taking air from the next to them. Uh, so I did also try pulling the power plug out and uh, I doubt many of you you will want to run the case like this but i did want to see what we were missing out on so i just popped in some extensions to push the riser cable out and yeah put that uh, fe card in there and still fairly average thermals here for the card finally for the combined stress test cpu at a slightly lower clock for the all systems go test you're seeing pretty similar gpu temps here as the gaming scenario but for an all systems go scenario as, as rare as that might be either of the two larger configurations are going to be a safer bet with your high powered graphics cards and again looking at the q58 that uh, it's still ahead here i did take some sound samples for each of the configurations and what you can expect just for your reference uh, so you know that's uh, what you might expect to accompany the thermal performance that you just saw so take a listen So using the larger 240 configuration, we can compare to our larger body of SFF case data. One quick note is that these aren't necessarily the same AIO, but the key factor is the RAD fans and the specs here, they're pretty similar. So I think it's fair to throw the larger NR200s into the conversation at this point. These are 18 plus liter cases, but the Shift XT in this big configuration is about 17 and a half. So uh, at the top, we have some of our best performance here, that NR200 along with A4H20. And yeah, even in a scenario where you'd expect closer results since it's just a CPU, the airflow path to the radiator is just not as direct for the Shift XT and that's why you do see a gap here. For gaming, those thermals we saw previously, they do place the case towards the end of the shortlist here. Of course, I do wanna emphasize these are all the better SFF cases that uh, we know of, so we are comparing against uh, the better ones. So the Shift XT, it's realistically more on the average side of things. Last thermal test here, the combined thermals, again, does land the case at the bottom of the shortlist here, and yeah, the thermal performance of this case is definitely not one of its strong suits, and if you're building in this case, I'd stick to more moderate components, especially on the GPU side. So what I did was a little brainstorming here, and in addition to a less optimal flow path through both side panels, because of the, the more limited ventilation from the way it's cut out. If you look at the case like the A4H20, it's a much smaller case, but there's one thing that uh, the designer absolutely nailed, and that was the position of the GPU. It's in closer proximity of the fans, and as a result, the exhaust, it's pretty direct. The position of the card in the Shift XT, you'll see it's very close to the bottom, and that is to allow for that compact configuration. Yes, for two slot cards, that shifted out position is not a reality, but the proximity of the fans to the side panel, that's not the main factor here. As you saw, even the FE card when it was shifted out to slot three for that kind of makeshift test, it didn't necessarily perform well. These futuristic shells, they're not particularly well vented, even though there are big slots cut out, but it's only, you know, maybe 50% cut out. But especially look at the shape of the bottom shell. It's hot air that's exhausting from the card. It's likely hitting those chamfered corners and there's no vents there, right? So it's just rolling back around because of the shape and it's soaking the card in its own heat. It's just going back into the fan. So I anticipate that's a trade-off here to get this particular look take a look at the Q58, which is a pretty similar setup with the card at the bottom, but at least that uh, case manages to cram in a bottom fan there, and that does actually help the card out a little bit. And I know we've spent quite a bit of time discussing the thermals here, and hopefully you have a pretty clear picture at this point. So yeah, if thermals are your top priority, this probably is not the best case for you. At the same time, I don't think that's what this case is about nor is it the main selling point here, right? And I think if Fantex, they just wanted to make it a really good thermal performer, you'd be looking at a different design. 
No other case that we compare to here allows the user to out of the box change the height and consequently the physical volume. Uh, this case is beefy, right? These thick shells out of the box. The UX is excellent. It's got all the bells and whistles, front IO panel. It's so amazing, you know, this shifting up and down. Uh, it's a joy to use this integrated lighting. And I know this is gonna be subjective, but dude, I think this case just looks so cool. Probably most importantly, it's really well suited to someone who maybe hasn't built a PC before, or this is your first SFF case. The way these cables are pre-routed at the bottom, the way they run to the power supply, this excellent documentation, the way the radiator plate swings, all these little things actually add up to what is a very pleasant experience. And I think if you're just getting into the game here, and you have reasonable cooling needs such as uh, Ryzen 5 or 7, you know, 3060 Ti, 3070, that combo, uh, I just set it up in the air boost mode with a simple air cooler, and you're gonna find this case to be a complete joy to use and maintain. I don't think thermally you're gonna have much of an issue there. And actually this case, it's pretty reasonably priced too, despite the very complete and high quality inclusions. Uh, it comes in black or silver, $170 US, 170 euros, and 160 GBP. And given the price versus the A4H20, it's pretty much the same, right? Uh, that we just reviewed in the uh, PCI Gen 4 version. I'd anticipate that you might wanna choose between either of those right now if you're just looking at cases. And actually, <laughs> besides the fact that they're both sandwich style cases, they couldn't be more different. I see the A4H20 as more of a mission focused, minimalist, SFF enthusiast level of case. Uh, for someone more experienced, you know, with a few builds under your belt and, you know, you know exactly what you want. And if performance is a strong consideration there too, that's the route I'd take. But the Evolved Shift XT, it's really nothing like that case. Uh, it's a case that can literally scale with your needs. You're not tied down to how you build it because you can change it every morning if you wanted to. It latches and it locks together with an aura of mechanical precision. Hey. This is the only beefy SFF case that I would trust to take me to the moon and back. And of course, I'm not planning on making that trip anytime soon, but I hope you found this review helpful, detailed build guide to come. I enjoyed this case very much. I hope you do get a chance to check it out. Please give a like, subscribe, links down below, and I'll see you in the next one.